In the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, former New Orleans attorney Ashton R. O'Dwyer Jr. became a target of government reprisals. He made public statements that criticized the United States and Louisiana governments for their poor responses and failures to protect citizens. And, after filing a class action lawsuit against federal, state, and city officials, he was abducted and imprisoned without a warrant and brutally treated. Six years after the storm and after most of his lawsuits were dismissed or denied, the federal government is still trying to silence O'Dwyer. My name is Ashton O'Dwyer. I'm age 63 at the present time. For 35 years prior to Hurricane Katrina, I was an Admiralty and Maritime lawyer with the law firm of Lemley and Kelleher. Part of the story deals with my relationship with my firm, former firm, and more particularly the federal court system in the Eastern District of Louisiana and in the Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. On Sunday morning, September 11, 2005, four people met in the Louisiana Attorney General's office in Baton Rouge. What transpired would affect Ashton O'Dwyer's life for years to come. He was an item on their agenda because of appearances on national television in which he criticized federal, state, and local governments for their failure to protect the citizens and for their inept response to the storm. Not only did they find his behavior embarrassing, but the most prominent member present, Justice Catherine D. Kimball, uttered words to the effect that, somebody's got to shut that guy up. He's giving us all a bad name. Justice Kimball worked closely with Louisiana's Chief Law Enforcement Officer, Attorney General Charles Foti. Her comments at a meeting in his Baton Rouge office on September 11, 2005 were, in effect, a directive to discipline an attorney who is exercising his First Amendment right as a private citizen to speak out about the government's ineptitude in the aftermath of Katrina. Justice Kimball brings to the court a special interest in criminal law that has brought her into close association with law enforcement personnel and may influence her perspective toward those who would speak out critically about the government. At issue is whether her personal views blur the line between First Amendment rights guaranteed by the Constitution and forms of speech, such as incitement to riot, that are clearly illegal. Supreme Court Justice Kimball and Attorney General Foti had a very close working relationship. And after the storm, they held meetings in Foti's Baton Rouge offices to discuss issues related to the administration of justice. Those so-called justice meetings were later continued in New Orleans. I was the one that went out and got the Admiral to start looking to help the criminal justice system along with Kitty Kimball. I went to Congress myself and got $62 million for the police agencies and DAs, police, sheriff, injury defenders. And I started immediately after the hurricane, after we did the evacuation and the rescue work of having the justice meetings and was the place of refuge for most of the criminal justice agencies from the surrounding area in Baton Rouge. We gave my office to it. When Justice Kimball came back to New Orleans and opened the Supreme Court, she continued the meetings each week, which I had started. Various links exist between Justice Catherine Dick Kimball and the law firm of Lemley and Kelleher, and they appear sufficiently consequential to call into question her impartiality in cases involving the law firm's partners. Kimball's brother, Kelly R. Dick, is the husband of Rochelle Dick, the attorney who represented Kimball in O'Dwyer's lawsuits. 
Shelley Dick is a principal partner in the law firm of Forrester and Dick. The other principal partner in that law firm is David C. Forrester, a former prosecutor for the State Attorney General and the younger brother of William R. Forrester, the partner in O'Dwyer's former law firm, who hand-delivered the ultimatum letter of September 15, 2005, from Lemley & Kelleher's chairman, Ernest L. Lanny Edwards, to O'Dwyer warning him to cease and desist from his activities or he would be in danger of termination. During the period when O'Dwyer's lawsuit against Kimball was ongoing, Timothy J. Palmateri and his daughter Danielle Palmateri Mitternight both worked for the state Supreme Court. Danielle was a law clerk for Kimball while her father, Timothy, was a Supreme Court Chief Justice Administrator for many years. Timothy Palmateri's nephew, David Redmond Jr., worked at Lemley & Kelleher along with law partner Joseph Larry Shea Jr. And post-Katrina, both left Lemley & Kelleher to join the new law firm of Bradley, Murchison, Kelly & Shea. In Louisiana, Interactions among members of law firms, bar associations, and the judiciary are often so intertwined that judicial decisions entirely free from bias or conflict of interest appear to be uncommon. The chief counsel of the Louisiana Attorney Disciplinary Board is Charles B. Platzmeyer, a Supreme Court appointee. Joseph L. Shea, a partner in Lumley & Kelleher, is a member of this board. He is also a committee member of the Supreme Court Task Force and a key member of the Louisiana State Bar Association, of which Frank X. Nooner Jr. was president. Other key members of the State Bar Association in 2005 included Ernest L. Edwards Jr. and Paul B. Deal, both partners at Lemley & Kelleher, with Edwards being the senior member and chairman. That same year, Paul Deal left Lemley and Kelleher to work as Assistant Attorney General under Charles Fody. Two other Lemley and Kelleher partners in 2005 were Charles R. Talley and Michael McGlone. Both are board members of the New Orleans Federal Bar Association who moved to the Keen Miller Law Firm in 2006. Post-Katrina, McGlone temporarily shared offices with Frank Nooner in Lafayette, Louisiana. In a lawsuit naming Justice Kimball as a defendant, O'Dwyer claimed that she set into motion a series of events that were detrimental to him when she suggested that he be silenced for his critical remarks to the media about the government and when she ordered an investigation of him. Kimball confirmed O'Dwyer's assertions when her defense counsel stated that Justice Kimball had a duty as the Justice of the Louisiana Supreme Court, the body charged with regulation of attorney conduct, to discuss O'Dwyer's media statements with the Chief Disciplinary Counsel and to initiate an investigation of his continued competence to practice law. The administrative duties of the court are, are tremendous. People don't recognize, I think, that we do that many administrative functions. We have uh, jurisdiction over discipline of all judges, of all lawyers. We write all sorts of different kinds of rules. I, I don't know that the public really realizes it because we kind of operate under the radar in many, in many instances. Uh, lawyer discipline cases go to no other court. They come straight to us. Kimball's lawyers filed a brief in which, unbelievably, she admitted that I had been talked about at the September 11, 2005 meeting. And she said, incredibly, that as a Louisiana Supreme Court justice, she had an obligation to order investigation into Ashton O'Dwyer, a member of the bar. Well, this was a monumentous admission on her part. She admitted the meeting, 
She admitted that I was talked about by her, and she admitted that she ordered an investigation into my mental competency. And who was she talking to? Well, she was talking to Charlie Fody, the guy who the state police worked for. She was talking to her chief disciplinary counsel, Charles Platzmeyer, who was playing my law firm and law partners like puppets. The state Supreme Court appoints the chief disciplinary counsel of the Louisiana Attorney Disciplinary Board. And when O'Dwyer was spotlighted at the Baton Rouge meeting, Platzmeyer knew what he had to do to help silence the dissident attorney. He was a member of a team that had a long history of working together. Platzmeyer was an invited presenter at the Law School Professionalism Orientations Program at Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge, organized by Nooner and the Louisiana State Bar Association. The largest financial sponsor of that program was the Lemley and Kelleher Law Firm. Invited speakers Justice Kimball and Chief Disciplinary Counsel Platzmeyer joined FODI at the second annual Summer Fellowship Program for Law Students, sponsored by the Attorney General's Office. Platzmeyer's office controls the ability of attorneys to practice law in the state of Louisiana, and he had close relationships with Joseph Larry Shea, Jr. and Ernest L. Edwards, Jr. O'Dwyer's law partners who were also members of the Louisiana Attorney Disciplinary Board. O'Dwyer was informed by law partner Charles R. Talley that he would be suspended from the practice of law by Platzmeyer unless he stopped giving interviews to the press, surrendered his weapons, and vacated his property. Talley's warning also implicated Shea, who had requested that Tally inform O'Dwyer of Platzmeyer's demands. Those demands were reiterated in a letter O'Dwyer received from Lemley and Kelleher's chairman, Ernest L. Edwards, Jr. Platzmeyer requested a copy of that letter. A second letter from Edwards terminated O'Dwyer, despite his earlier resignation on September 16, 2005. A copy was also sent to Platzmeyer. O'Dwyer formally requested that Platzmeyer investigate Tally, Shea, and Edwards for their improvident use of Platzmeyer's name and authority in their earlier attempts to silence him and force him to conform to other demands. Platzmeyer assured O'Dwyer that he had not been suspended. In subsequent telephone conversations concerning O'Dwyer's requested investigation, Platzmeyer claimed that he had no knowledge of the Baton Rouge meeting, that his only knowledge of O'Dwyer's notoriety came from a September 8, 2005 article in the Wall Street Journal, and that he didn't know why Talley and Edwards assumed they could use his name and authority in their communications with O'Dwyer. Platzmeyer informed O'Dwyer that his office declined to conduct a formal investigation into the post-Katrina conduct of his former law partners, thereby suggesting that they may have had Platzmeyer's tacit approval to use his authority to coerce O'Dwyer's compliance. Platzmeyer presented a continuing legal education ethics program at a statewide conference in Baton Rouge with a reception sponsored by the Louisiana State Bar Association and Louisiana Bar Foundation. The keynote address was delivered by Attorney General Charles Fody. Frank X. Nooner Jr. divulged to a surprised O'Dwyer that Platzmeyer had indeed been present at the Baton Rouge meeting, where Platzmeyer is alleged to have stated words to the effect that, I know some of his law partners. I'll contact them to learn more about him. O'Dwyer was now better able to piece together the significance of the warnings he had received earlier from several of his law partners. 
O'Dwyer subsequently made Platzmeier a defendant in a lawsuit against some former law partners and others who allegedly conspired against him and contributed to the injuries and emotional distress inflicted upon him post-Katrina. O'Dwyer specifically charged Platzmeier with deception about his attendance at the meeting in Baton Rouge and about his role in recruiting O'Dwyer's law partners to his detriment. That lawsuit, Civil Action Number 067280, was assigned to Judge Ginger Berrigan of the United States District Court for the Eastern District of Louisiana. Frank X. Nooner, Jr. was president of the Louisiana Bar Association in 2005 and 2006. He and the Bar Association hosted the 6th Annual Law School Professionalism Orientations Program at which Platzmer was an invited speaker. Nooner complimented Attorney General Foti and Justice Kimball for working with Governor Kathleen Blanco's administration to maintain funding for the Access to Justice initiatives. Nooner was also an attendee at the meeting in Foti's Baton Rouge office, along with Kimball, Platzmeier, and Foti. When LSU's Paul M. A. Bear Law Center named Nooner Distinguished Alumnus of the Year, Kimball complimented him by declaring, Frank has excelled in many legal and leadership arenas that bring credit both to the law center and the profession, but may be none greater than his contribution as president of the Louisiana State Bar Association during the time of the 2005 hurricanes. Nooner and his Louisiana State Bar Association staff were escorted by state troopers back to New Orleans after the hurricane so that they could retrieve documents and equipment from the Bar Association's offices. The operation was arranged by Attorney General Foti and Justices Kimball and Chet D. Trailer. Nooner and Foti were at Camp Amtrak with the past president of the Paris Bar, Jean-Marie Bergouberou, and his colleagues. Later that afternoon, Nooner brought them unannounced to O'Dwyer's residence in a state vehicle, together with two armed associates of Attorney General Foti. Nooner repeated to a group at a Houston seminar the words that Kimball had said at the September 11th meeting. Somebody's got to shut that guy up. He's giving us all a bad name. Nooner later confirmed Kimball's statement to O'Dwyer. Nooner also revealed to O'Dwyer that Platzmeier had been present at the Baton Rouge meeting on September 11, 2005, and he ultimately revealed that Attorney General Foti had also attended that meeting. By September 3, 2005, Attorney General Foti and Secretary Stalder of the Louisiana Department of Public Safety and Corrections had set up a temporary prison facility at the Union Passenger Terminal, known alternatively as Camp Amtrak or Camp Greyhound. Both had personnel assigned to that facility along with other contingents, such as the National Guard, before his election as Attorney General in 2004, Foti had been Orleans Parish Sheriff for almost 30 years. The friendly relationship that Foti had with Stalder began in January 1997, when Foti proposed that his deputies and Stalder's state officers work together in New Orleans, and the two agencies have continued their close cooperation ever since. With additional money from the state, the number of state prisoners housed in New Orleans expanded from 800 in 1973 to more than 7,000 in 2005, and Foti was managing a multi-million dollar budget. In the wake of Hurricane Katrina, one of Foti's priorities was the highly publicized prosecution of well-known private citizens which some observers speculated was designed to call attention to himself in anticipation of his 2007 re-election campaign. 
New Orleans attorney Alan Usry, who worked for Fody for 29 years while Fody was criminal sheriff, stated that the high-profile arrests had been good political PR for Fody, who reaped a harvest of media attention because of them. The police action taken against O'Dwyer, who had been openly critical of the government's actions post-Katrina, may have been triggered by Fody's desire to bolster his reputation of being tough on crime and enhance his image as protector of the state. While Fody could not prosecute O'Dwyer for any criminal offense, once Justice Catherine Kimball voiced her desire to silence O'Dwyer at the meeting held in Fody's office on September 11, 2005, he likely contemplated how he could accommodate her wishes. As the state's chief law enforcement officer, he would have the cooperation of Secretary Stalder and his state police and corrections resources. Thus, just after midnight of the day O'Dwyer filed class action suit number 054181 against governmental entities, the state police, without specific orders or warrant to justify their actions, were dispatched to abduct and transport an unsuspecting O'Dwyer from his home to Camp Amtrak, where prison guards were allowed to have their way with the enraged attorney whose taunts were answered with multiple assaults of pepper spray and beanbag rounds fired at close range to his thighs while handcuffed or locked in one of its improvised cages. On November 2nd and 3rd, 2006, Fody was keynote speaker at the American Bar Association's Fall Conference in New Orleans on disaster preparedness and the criminal justice system. Brought together were key members of the New Orleans and Louisiana justice community who would play important roles in the malicious prosecution of O'Dwyer as participants in the ever-broadening coalition against him. Notable at that conference were Justice Kimball, Secretary Stalder, Judge Ginger Berrigan, Director of the Incident Management Center, Eric Sivula, New Orleans Criminal Sheriff Marlon Gussman, Chief of the Criminal Division of the Louisiana Department of Justice, Burton Guidry, and United States Attorney, Jim Letton. O'Dwyer's attempts to identify and bring to trial those who were responsible for or who were complicit in his abduction, brutalization, torture, and illegal incarceration on September 20th, 2005, have all proved to be futile. His efforts to expose those who ordered the hit have been stonewalled and covered up at every turn. Danny Schechter, in an investigative film, outlined the four levels of activity that characterize a conspiracy. They are the person or persons who, one, gives the order, two, takes the order and carries it out, three, knows what is going on and looks the other way, and four, should have known what is going on. People look for the top person who ought to be accountable, and they're gonna be able to say, uh, or at least try to argue, if he did give that order, he's the fellow giving that order, and we were following that order. An example of the government's response to O'Dwyer's pursuit of redress within the court system is exemplified by the following exchange between Judge Ginger Berrigan and Assistant Attorney General Michael C. Keller, speaking for Fody's Louisiana Department of Justice. Here, Judge Berrigan appears to accept that law enforcement cannot be held to account for its actions during a state of emergency. The court, are you saying that anything that happened at Camp Amtrak then is not, no matter what happened there, that no lawsuit can be filed because it's all an emergency? Mr. Keller, that's what we have upheld. The court, okay. Michael Keller worked in the Louisiana Department of Justice with Phyllis Glazer and other assistant attorneys general under Attorney General Fody and Paul Deal, who joined Fody's Department of Justice in 2005 as chief of its New Orleans office. 
Keller represented the interests of the state in many court proceedings and also prosecuted lawsuits on behalf of the state. Judge Ginger Berrigan recognized Keller for his versatility when she referred to him as our man of many hats. Paul Deal has been a partner at the Lemley and Kelleher Law Firm for 44 years before joining the Louisiana Department of Justice in 2005. He had been a colleague of O'Dwyer's for the 35 years that O'Dwyer had also been associated with Lemley and Kelleher. Deal was responsible for assigning state attorneys to defend the state's interests, including the parties whom O'Dwyer sued for civil rights violations against him at Camp Amtrak under color of law. In October 2006, Deal encountered O'Dwyer on the steps of the federal courthouse in New Orleans and remarked, you're lucky you didn't have a broomstick shoved up your ass seemingly in reference to the widely publicized case about the treatment received by Abner Luima, who was brutalized and abused by New York police in 1997. Deal's remark revealed how quickly a collegial relationship can change into an adversarial one. It also reflects the smug confidence of the Louisiana Department of Justice that it would not be held to account for its actions. The government's sanctimonious public statements about holding public officials accountable for their actions stands in stark contrast to the realities of its brutal actions against Ashton O'Dwyer for engaging in protected speech and its subsequent denial to him of any redress. Public officials, and especially law enforcement officers, will be held accountable for their acts and that any abuse of power, especially that power that violates the rights and the civil liberties of our citizens, will have serious consequences. The citizens of this country will not, should not, and we intend that they will never have to fear the individuals who are called upon to protect them. On September 17, 2005, three days before O'Dwyer was abducted and imprisoned, he was visited by people who had never been at his home before, including two groups of totally unexpected guests. Just two days earlier, he had received an ultimatum from his law firm that threatened him with termination if he did not cease his interviews with the media, surrender his personal firearms, and vacate his residence. And the following day, September 16th, he had relayed his resignation from Lemley and Kelleher through one of his law partners, Charles Talley. Still not fully aware of the September 11th Baton Rouge meeting, O'Dwyer found himself playing host to many people milling about his St. Charles Avenue home in New Orleans. Imagine his surprise when Judge Ivan Lamel and his wife, Patricia Waddell Lamel, dropped by for a social visit and stayed long enough to enjoy some soft drinks with him. They had never been to O'Dwyer's home before, nor had they ever associated with him socially. Lamel is a United States federal judge for the Eastern District of Louisiana. Previously, he had been an assistant district attorney for Orleans Parish and a Louisiana assistant attorney general before becoming a U.S. magistrate for the Eastern District of Louisiana for 14 years. O'Dwyer, who was not commonly visited by the judiciary, was at a loss to understand why Lamel chose to pay him a visit that day. The Saturday before the hit, which was the 17th of September, an individual who worked for Fody named Burton Guidry, who was the chief of the criminal division of the Louisiana Department of Justice, shows up here at my house out of the blue with a, an investigator named Ricky Murphy. He's also with the Attorney General's office. And he's got in tow uh, the then Bar Association president, Frank Noonan. These people have never been to my house in their lives. I've never been to their house. I'd never met Gidry before. What are they doing at my house? 
O'Dwyer later wondered whether some of the visitors to his home could have been connected with an investigation of him that had been initiated by Judge Kimball. There was yet another surprise. Nooner, Gidry, and Murphy had brought along with them several French-speaking lawyers, one of whom was the president of the Paris Bar. They had been touring New Orleans post-Katrina and had met with Charles Foti and others at Camp Amtrak before being driven to O'Dwyer's house as observers in a state vehicle. Why the visiting French attorneys were brought to O'Dwyer's home still remains a mystery. O'Dwyer also thought that Gidry and Murphy were looking for anything that could form the basis of an arrest. However, so there were probably 40 people milling about the property that particular Saturday afternoon. They realized that they couldn't do what they came here to do. And by the way, they were wearing sidearms, which was a little excessive given that it was the 17th of September. They couldn't do what they came here to do in front of witnesses. So they gave me a message. The message was, hey O'Dwyer, complaints have been made about you at the highest levels of government. Well, I was about to file a lawsuit against the governor. So when they said highest levels of government, I thought they were talking about the governor. Little did I know that what they were talking about was Fody and Kimball, the head of the judicial branch and the head of the law enforcement branch, equal in power to the governor, okay? But I definitely believe that Fody and Kimball were involved in it. And they said, if you don't um, cease and desist, something's gonna happen to you, that's the message. And whether it was disbarment, whether it was no longer uh, a, a partner with Lemley and Kelleher, I, I just didn't know. And Burton Guidry looks at me after delivering this message and he says to me, either you are the bravest man I've ever known or you are the dumbest son of a blank on the face of the earth. God bless you, brother. And he blessed me. And in looking back on it, I now believe that that was a kiss of death, a la mafia style. Putting together various fragments of information, O'Dwyer began to suspect that those words were not just a warning, but rather a sign that a plan was already in progress. So the plan was concocted that I was going to be intimidated and coerced into silence in any way possible, whether that meant using the state police or using Plattsmeyer or using my law firm they were going to try to shut me up in accordance with Kimball's instructions. The next thing I learned was that right before Nooner, Gidry, and Ricky Murphy, the latter two working for Fody in the, U in the Louisiana Department of Justice, right before they came to my house on Saturday afternoon, September 17, 2005, they went to Camp Amtrak and were given a guided tour of the facility by who I don't know, but I do know from federal and state reports that have been written about who was at Camp Amtrak, doing what, etc. since Katrina. One called the Technical Assistance Report by Jeffrey Schwartz and David Webb commissioned by the Louisiana Department of Public Safety and Corrections, which employs both the state police and the Department of Corrections. Lieutenant Matthew Matt Reed, who was from the Louisiana State Penitentiary at Angola, signed a report on September 20, 2005, in which he personally admitted to acts of brutality against O'Dwyer at Camp Amtrak although he grossly underrepresented the number and severity of the attack. And another one called Katrina Lessons Learned, commissioned by the White House, that the following entities had people at Camp Amtrak when I was there. 
the Department of Homeland Security, FEMA, the FBI, the Department of Justice, both Louisiana and federal, the United States Attorney's Office, yes, Latin and his gang, okay? And there's one in particular there that I want to name by name right now. His name is Michael Magner. Assistant U.S. Attorney Michael Magner coordinated the manning of the temporary jail facility established at Camp Amtrak. He and O'Dwyer had recognized one another at the prison. Magner and his co-workers had to have been aware of the brutality and torture that was being meted out to O'Dwyer at Camp Amtrak and he undoubtedly had conversations with Lumley and Kelleher personnel about O'Dwyer. O'Dwyer subsequently gave accounts of his maltreatment to agents of the Louisiana Department of Public Safety and Corrections, the FBI, and both the Louisiana and the U.S. Departments of Justice. The responses from these agencies all indicate their refusal to take any action suggesting that these state and federal agencies were complicit in a cover -up. Many of O'Dwyer's requests for action were disregarded. Quoting from Mark Kappelhoff of the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice, after careful consideration, we concluded that the evidence does not establish a prosecutable violation of the federal criminal civil rights statutes. Accordingly, we have closed our investigation and, based on current information, do not plan to take any further action. To date, no one has yet been held responsible. However, someone had to have made the decision to employ police in the action taken against O'Dwyer. And, as Louisiana's chief law enforcement officer, Attorney General Foti had an important voice as to how the state police were used. What cannot be denied is that nine days after the September 11, 2005 meeting in Baton Rouge, state police officers were dispatched to abduct O'Dwyer from his home and transport him to Union Passenger Terminal in downtown New Orleans, which was the site of the temporary prison called Camp Amtrak. His abduction and treatment there are described in greater detail in part one of this series. The narrative thus far tells only part of O'Dwyer's story, which is still being played out. Not yet told are his suspension, disbarment, bankruptcy, imprisonment over an alleged threat, and the court's suspension of his Katrina litigation. In the words of former United States President Harry S. Truman, once a government is committed to the principle of silencing the voice of opposition, it has only one way to go, and that is down the path of increasingly repressive measures until it becomes a source of terror to all its citizens and creates a country where everyone lives in fear. Just as 